Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jessica Likewise. I'm the CEO of Hope Education Services. I also just re relocated across the country and I'm studying for my BCBA exam. As I'm studying, I'm making videos just for you so you can study along with me. Today, we're gonna talk a bit about a behavior chain and what chaining is. <music> Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. As I said, today we're gonna to take a deep dive into a behavior chain and what chaining is. We're gonna learn everything you need to know to be successful on your BCBA exam about chaining. So what is a behavior chain? Well, a behavior chain is a series of events that are linked together. And what makes them special is that each step in a behavior chain or each behavior in a chain is serves as two purposes. Number one, it serves as the SD, for the next step in the chain, and it also serves as a conditioned reinforcer for the previous step in the chain. Well, that may sound a little complicated, but I'm gonna make it make sense for you. Now, just to note, the exception is the first and last step. The first step obviously has no step before it, so it is not a conditioned reinforcer, it's just an SD. And the last step has no step after it, so it is not an SD, it's just a conditioned reinforcer. So blah, that sounds really complicated. So let's make it sound really simple. So let's say a child needs to make a bed. We're just going to, for the sake of this video, say there's four steps in making the bed. Number one, they put on the fitted sheet. Number two, they put on the flat sheet. Number three, they put in the blanket. And number four, they put on the pillow. So in this example, putting on the fitted sheet, once that fitted sheet is on the bed, that becomes the SD or the trigger for the next behavior, which is putting on the flat sheet. Now, putting on the flat sheet becomes the SD for the next step, which is gonna be putting on the blanket, but it also serves as a conditioned reinforcer for the previous step of putting on the fitted sheet. And the reason being for that is because a conditioned reinforcer is something that becomes reinforcing while a child is waiting to gain access to the ultimate reinforcers. The ultimate reinforcer is the bed being made or potentially a reward that the child or learner is gonna get for after making the bed, but it is what is reinforcing the step before it until the child gets to that point. All right, we have putting on the fitted sheet, we have put on the flat sheet. Now let's talk about putting the blanket on. Well, putting the blanket on is going to be, number one, the SD for the next step, which is gonna be putting the pillow on. And it's also gonna be the conditioned reinforcer for putting the flat sheet on, right? And then we get to the last step, putting the pillow on the bed. Once he, the, he puts the pillow on the bed, it is just a reinforcer. It's a conditioned reinforcer for putting on the blanket. It also gains the child access to the ultimate reinforcer, which is the bed is made or potentially a reward if the child is getting social positive reinforcement. Or there could be ways you can get social negative reinforcement for making the bed um, if maybe a consequence is being removed. So that is certainly um, that is the ultimate reinforcer. So then there is no next step. So the last step is not an SD. So I hope that makes sense. So what's the difference between a behavior chain and chaining? Well, behavior chains exist naturally. Everything we do basically has a behavior chain if it's a, a behavior with multiple steps. So it could be cooking dinner, it could be making a bed, like in the example, it could be, it could be feeding a pet, whatever the example is. If there's multiple steps in and completing an activity, it is a behavior chain. They are linked together. So what is chaining? Well, chaining is what a therapist does when they're teaching a complex skill to learners. They're breaking it down into individual steps. Because for you and I, we may be able to just automatically put all these things together and do it. If we want to we say we get a brand new microwave, we might just already know how to use it, right? We know to take it out of the box and plug it in to take the plastic part at the, the tray out of the plastic and put it in our coffee cup and put water in it and put it into the microwave. We don't need all those steps. But sometimes for learners that are challenged in learning the everyday tasks or learning multiple um, step activities, they may need a therapist to break the task down into little steps and teach them one step at a time. So that is called chaining. So when a therapist is teaching an activity and they're using chaining, they create what's called a task analysis. A task analysis are the steps required to complete an activity. Now, the steps that are required to complete an activity, they're going to vary on for several reasons. Number one, they're going to vary depending upon the child's age, the learner's age. They're going to depend upon the child's skill level. So I, brought, I broke the bed down into four steps. But if a child's really struggling, you might have to break that down into 10 steps. You might have to say, you know, you're going to take the fitted sheet and you're going to put 
put one the left corner on, then you're going to put the right corner on, and then you're going to pull it, then you're going to put on the bottom corner, then you're going to put on the top corner, right? So there might be multiple steps. So depending upon the skill level of the child and the age of the child and their ability to understand what's happening, how much support they need, that's going to depend upon how many steps are in the TA. Also, it's going to vary, right? Every bed is different, every sheet is different. So it's going to vary depending upon the environment. So once that task analysis is complete, it's the step of tasks, then we're gonna be really focused on how are we going to teach this chaining? How are we gonna teach this task analysis? Well, there were three ways in which you can teach a task analysis. The first is called forward chaining. The second is called backward chaining. And the third is called total task completion. So what's the difference? When you're using forward chaining, you're starting from the first step and you're teaching the child the steps in order. This is really good for children who struggle with generalization because it's really teaching them sequentially how they're going to do things. So if you're making the bed, you have the child put on the fitted sheet. Once he gets the fitted sheet on, then the therapist initially will do all the rest of the things for them. They're gonna put on the flat sheet, the blanket and the pillow, and then the child gets access to reinforcement. Now that is the limitation of forward chaining, is that the child is not getting, or the learner is not getting access to reinforcement immediately upon finishing the behavior that they're supposed to be completing in the chain because they're waiting for the therapist to finish the rest of the chain for them. And then they get reinforcement. So this may not work well for learners that need immediate reinforcement or immediate gratification immediately upon um, finishing a behavior. If a child has challenging behaviors like tantrum or non-compliance, forward chaining may not be for them. You know, obviously you're teaching the first step. First, you're going to have the child do the first step. Then you're going to have them do the first two steps, then three steps, however many steps they are, but you're teaching them in order. So then we go to backwards chaining. Well, backwards chaining is the complete opposite of forward chaining. You're going to be starting with the last step. The therapist completes all of the steps in the chain up until the last step, and then the child finishes the behavior, and then they immediately get reinforcement. Most therapists like this because kids get immediately access to reinforcement. So this is my preferred method. I always use backwards training if possible. There are some cases in which it wouldn't be possible, but typically you can always use backwards training. So again, if the child is gonna do the last step, then they're gonna do the last two steps, the last three steps until they can complete the entire activity independently. Now, when you move on to adding another step, that's gonna depend upon whatever mastery criterion is set by the BCBA or whoever's running the program. Um, they're gonna be the ones who's deciding it might be the child has to get it three days independently or five days independently. Sometimes a therapist will consider a target mastered when it's 80 to 100% accuracy. So let's just say the child's reading sight words and there's a list of 25 words and those 25 words are one, um, they're being scored on, in one category. So you know, if the child gets 80% that those words are considered mastered, you can't do that for TA. They have to get it completely independently because you can't um, be successful microwaving food if you can only do 80% of the task of microwaving food. So that's my take on that. So the third and final teaching procedure is called total task completion. So when using total task completion, the child is expected to perform all of the steps in the chain. Now he may be or she may be helped and assisted by the therapist. You might be using prompting or shaping with the, with the behavior chaining, but they're, com they're completing all of the tasks. So let's say the child is, he's now in forward chaining, right? He just did, he just put the fitted sheet on. And then in backward chaining, he just started off by putting the pillow on. Here, and he's gonna start off the first time you're teaching this, with doing all four steps. The therapist will help him with any steps that he does not know how to do using whatever prompting procedure was set by the BCBA. Probably in this case, I would assume some sort of either graduated guidance or physical prompting. But you know, you're, the therapist is gonna help, but you're, the child is doing all four steps. The child is actively involved in participating in all four steps. Even if they can't do them independently, the therapist is not doing them, they're prompting the child to do them. So that is total task completion. So I tend to prefer either, like I said, backwards training or total task completion if the learner is older and if they're not really struggling from step to step. You know, total task completion works really well for um, learners that are older and where you're just assisting them along the way and they don't necessarily need so many steps and so much structure in how to learn an activity. So for example, like an older child that is learning how to heat up their food in the microwave, I might use total task completion because I know that they may not necessarily need me to, to 
train every single step independently. They're just going to need me to teach them how to do it and, and helping them with every step along the way will get that point across. So total task completion can definitely be very effective and saves a lot of time. It's a lot faster to use total task completion than either backwards training or forwards training. So make sure you take that into account when you're deciding which of these procedures to use. So the other thing I wanted to go into is how do you collect baseline data when doing a TA? We know we always want to collect baseline data for several reasons. Number one, insurance companies, right? If we're doing ABA, we know a lot of funding comes to insurance companies. They like to see baseline data. Number two, it allows us to determine the accuracy of an intervention. Without baseline data, we don't know if it, if it worked, what we did worked. We don't know if maybe a child already had that skill. And sometimes baseline data can actually help us understand which one of these procedures that we are going to use. So when you're collecting baseline data, what you're going to do is there's two procedures that you can use. You're going to use either a single opportunity procedure or a multiple opportunity procedure. And it's important to get this down because you can't necessarily conduct baseline probes the same way that you would when you're doing discrete trial training. The one thing to do that there is to note is just like discrete trial training, you want to be very careful to not teach while you're collecting baseline data because if you do, then there's multiple days of baseline, there's not efficacy and treatment data. So single opportunity probing, what does that mean? In terms of a TA, it means that you're gonna have a child start a skill. So they're going to start making their bed. And then whatever step they can't do, you stop on that step, you finish for them, and all the subsequent um, steps are counted as incorrect. Because the assumption is that if the child couldn't get to step two, then they're not able to get to step three. So for in the example of making the bed, let's say you're probing using single opportunity data. Let's say the child puts the fitted sheet on, then doesn't know how to put the flat sheet on. Well, then the therapist would put on the flat sheet, they put on the blanket, they put on the pillow, and only the first step would be counted as correct. And the therapist would not give a child the chance to try the other steps. That's different from multiple opportunity baseline probing, which is where the therapist would give the child a chance to complete every single step in the TA. So let's just say the child, again, he's putting on the fitted sheet, he gets it, then he struggles with the flat sheet. Well, the therapist puts on the flat sheet and then she gives him a chance to do the next step again on his own. So let's just say he got the fitted sheet, he didn't get the flat sheet, but then he was able to put on the blanket. Well, that, that score of the blanket is still counted as correct independent of whether or not the previous step was marked as incorrect. I don't like mul uh, multiple opportunity probing because I'm a big believer that a child has to be able to complete all the steps in order or they can't do the task, especially when they're chaining, right? Because we know that the each step becomes an SD for the next step. So I tend to use single opportunity probing, but whatever you decide is up to you. So I really hope that this was helpful in helping you not only study for your exam, but understanding how to use chaining and how to use it effectively for kids. I would love to answer your questions. If you have any questions, head over to my website, hopeeducationservices.com. There's a contact form right on there. Drop your question and I'll get back to you and subscribe to this channel. I'm going to be posting more videos just like this. You know, I'm really passionate about number one, me passing my, my BCBA exam, but also helping you pass your BCBA exam. So if you found this helpful, subscribe, share this with friends, and I'll see you in the next video.